Heavenly Father, so grateful for who you are. We're so thankful that we have the chance to come together as your church, the assembly of believers, desiring to uh, know more about you, uh, understand on a deeper level who you are, uh, and as we study today who we are in you, what you have made us the position that you have put us in by uh, the glory of your name and the praise to your grace and your mercy and your love in our lives. And so I pray that uh, in it, it would build a greater and greater degree of gratitude in our own lives. Uh, and as we do, that it would cause us to walk forward, desiring to serve you and please you in all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. We, we began last week a series in the book of Ephesians, we said uh, we were going to move quite slowly through this series because it's a weighty text that uh, as it's written, it is not written in a kind of flowing narrative style where you can take big chunks, but rather that every single sentence, every single part of a sentence has uh, a pretty significant deep meaning to it that we would kind of walk closely with and explain, read, explain, read, explain, and spend uh, really what will be the next few months in the book of Ephesians. Now to prove our point, last week we just got through one verse, right? And so we spent the bulk of our time kind of looking at what that uh, verse was going to mean and how that very beginning verse was a microcosm of the whole of the text, which really breaks down into two key parts, uh, which I want to begin to unfold the first part of that today, and we'll spend several weeks in that. We said the two parts are this. Uh, the whole first half of the letter to the church in Ephesus is about our position in Christ. What has God made you if you indeed are in Christ? What does that look like? How uh, should we think of the way that God has worked within us? And then the whole second half of the book moves into our practice in Christ. What does it mean to walk out our position? Now, the reason that Paul does this in such a manner, I think is specifically important. It's where I wanted to spend some time starting this morning, and, and I want to do this in a way that for our elementary kids, maybe especially would kind of bring them into this, because uh, I think by and large, our culture, uh, and as a parent, I think I'm guilty of this at times too, uh, is more interested in what we can get out of our practices than really recognizing what our position might be in any given point of time. Like, so as a parent, maybe you're, you're better at instructing people, uh, you're instructing your kids to do certain things and not do certain things than you are of reminding them who they are. Um, this week I was thinking about a classical masterpiece that I'm particularly fond of, and maybe our young people, as you follow along with this story, could guess which one I'm talking about. But it's uh, it's about a king, uh, a royal family. In fact, uh, he is in, he's not yet the king, but the king in waiting. Uh, good things are expected to happen for him uh, until his father, the sitting king, is brutally murdered. Not only that, but uh, in the midst of this, uh, this young king in waiting is framed for the murder. And then he is forced into exile. He leaves the kingdom that was once meant to be him, his. He hides out for years. In fact, uh, he's so content with this plan of hiding, begins to blame himself for the exile, and would really just live out all of his days with a uh, contentment to let his kingdom go by the wayside so that he could enjoy his selfish living. Now, uh, that would just continue to be the story, except that at one point in time, a friend from his childhood actually accidentally stumbles upon him in his exile. Now, she thought he was dead, and so imagine her surprise that here is this living king. Now, what her compelling argument to him is, is you have some things that you need to do. Go back and do what you're supposed to do. Now, here's what happens, as so often happens in our lives. When we're told to go do something, Without a rationale or a reason, a lot of times we're rejecting of it. Or we find in our own lives all of these obstacles, these hurdles, these reasons why we wouldn't, these things that are shortcomings in our own lives or causes for us not to, right? And that's exactly what he does. He's ah, not going back there. I can't go back there. There's too many things, too many stumbling blocks, too many hurdles. I am incapable of getting done what needs to be done. 
And again, the story would have just continued in that way if it weren't for the second person who arrives, which is a wise old advisor who shows up and does not come to him with a message of what he ought to do, but comes with a message that goes like this. You remember who you are. Now, I see like half of you smiling, which means you're a better fan of classic cinema than the other half. Let me give you the clip, and you can uh, follow along with me. You go ahead and play that clip, Zoe. Sure do, you move fossils, boy. Bye. Hey, wait. You know my father? Correction, I know your father. I hate to tell you this, but he died a long time ago. Nope, wrong again. <laughs> He's alive, and I'll show him to you. You follow old Rafiki, he knows the way. Come on. Don't dawdle. Hurry up! Hey, whoa, wait, wait. Come on. Come on! Would you slow down? Stop! That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Father. Remember. All right, clear up a couple things. One, 1995, that's the pinnacle of Disney. They just, it's downhill from there. So, but it doesn't get any better than The Lion King. Two, uh, just ignore like the bad theology of the whole your ancestors are in the stars type of thing and all that Buddhist crap. Uh, that's not true either. However, there is one specific point in this that I think is necessary for us and a good reminder of this and, and maybe a value that in, in all types of places you will find examples of what the gospel message looks like. But Mufasa comes back to Simba, his son. So some of you are like, I can't believe that's where you went with this piece of classical masterpiece. But it is, okay? And, and so in this, Mufasa comes to his son Simba and he does not say, go do, but first and foremost says, remember who you are, right? And, and so as we look through the letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus, he's going to appeal 
in this same way. We're going to begin the process this week. It'll last several weeks where you'll see this over and over and over again, that the desire of Paul is not first and foremost to give us a list of instructions in order for us to do some things so that we might be made right with God, but rather to remember who God has made us, to remember our position in Christ first, to remember who we are. Now, the thing is, this is vital to us, especially in 21st century America, because the whole nature and flow of our culture, our society, is to focus on you feeling like you need to earn your position in all things. I'll prove it to you. Um, Imagine that you meet two uh, wildly successful multimillionaires, right? And, and you learn that one has uh, inherited all of their riches uh, from a relative who passed away, who was distant to them, who was uh, exceedingly wealthy. And prior to that, they had been really kind of a mess up in their lives, haven't done a lot of things right or well or good, uh, were always struggling, always behind. But upon receiving an inheritance of a few million dollars, have now uh, been wildly successful because of it, do whatever they want, enjoy the freedoms that they have enjoyed. Uh, and then you meet a second person who is an entirely self-made man, right? Came from nothing, built up their own business, uh, has built it into a massive enterprise and is doing very well because of that. Just, let's just ask societally, which one has garnished more respect? The second, right? The, the second, and, and that's an obvious thing to us because our whole of culture has built ourselves up upon the idea that we ought to earn our way into the position that we have. Now, now there's some value in that, and I'm not displaying kind of like all of this doesn't matter type of attitude. However, there's a real difficulty when we apply this into the spiritual realm. There's two things that really kind of keep us from this being the case with any real value or any real ability to work and operate in this way when it comes to our relationship with God. The first is that you and I are broken people and we're, we're fallen and our failures keep us from earning our position before the Lord. In fact, one of the beautiful things about the Bible is it lays out God's law or God's intentions for us, the ways we ought to live, and the reality is if you begin to read it and you stay focused in it and you spend time uh, actually understanding what it says, and then you put that and apply it into your own life and go, what if I placed this standard on me? you would find that each and every one of us fall short. And not just once, not just twice, but again and again and again and again. When Jesus came uh, and walks the earth, he begins his ministry very early on with a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, in this sermon, his first set of points is that we would think about the things that we had heard were said in the law, like things like hard things, like you shouldn't murder, or you shouldn't commit adultery. And he says, but what I'm saying to you is you think you're okay because you haven't done these things. However, if your heart is filled with anger, you're guilty of murder. If your uh, heart is filled with lust, you're guilty of adultery. That the idea of sin begins inside of a person in their heart and finds itself played out. And the major point he was making, he summarizes it with this, is if you want to be right with God, therefore you ought to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And each and every one of us would look at such a standard and go, well, we ain't that. And so if our whole focus on what religion might be is to work harder and acquire for ourselves a position of righteousness before God, the major point of uh, contention and problem we will all face is that we're just not good enough. And you'll just stumble and you'll fail and you'll stumble and you'll fail and you'll grow in your discontentment and your frustration over how hard you want to be better and how much you are not. It's like an ongoing diet plan that you just can't keep, right? And then uh, the second piece of this is a certain type of pride that is smaller in uh, contingency. There's a smaller group of people who really believe in such a way, but some certainly do. It's that they begin to buy into the fact that they are doing good enough. 
right? Like now maybe that standard of perfect is a little bit too much of a standard, but there's really, uh, by comparison, a lot of good things that we're doing. And so if I could just stick with that and I could just earn my way further and further and further and further down the road, maybe I will earn my way into a good position before God. In fact, in Jesus' time, there was a whole contingency of people who did this. They were known as the Pharisees. And so they took this same law that Jesus says, go ahead, apply that standard to you and see if it works. And in their arrogance said, it does work, and I keep that, and I'm good by that. And Jesus is constantly pointing out how wrong they are in it, and they're continuously rejecting him. And in particular, here's the biggest flaw and the biggest fault that they have in this, is as you grow in an arrogance to think that maybe I have done enough to earn my position before God, the Pharisees reflect what you and I would see in our own pride, which is that we feel like God owes us something. God, how could you not give me this? How could this happen to me? How could my life not go this way? Because I've done all of this, right? You think of the prodigal son parable, right? And the older brother who says, I've slaved all these years for you. And look how you have treated me. And so whether it is in our failings and our stumblings or whether it is in our boastful, arrogant pride, when we begin to think that what we do establishes who we are before God first and foremost. We have put the cart before the horse. We're walking backwards in what it looks like. And so as Paul the Apostle is writing to churches in the Lord, right? he's writing to them in a specific order with a specific intention. And he does this maybe uh, most clearly in the letter to the Ephesians, which is to say your position in Christ by the grace of God, has to be first and foremost in determining what we do, how we live out, what it looks like to practice our faith. And so we started last week, Ephesians 1, verse 1, and said Paul recognizes this in himself when he says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, not by his good workings, but by God's will for his life. And then he says to the saints, Right? So he begins by calling us saints, recognizing our position is one of someone who is saved, someone who is in Christ, who are at Ephesus, and then he says who are faithful in Christ Jesus, that you are walking out, you're practicing your faith based on the position you have. Now, watch how he moves forward from verse 2. We're going to read through verse 8 to this morning. Uh, and in doing so, we're going to see the ways that Paul is going to highlight and emphasize what it means to have a position in Christ. Watch how he starts this off. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is uh, the very idea that you and I have something that is without our own merit. That's what grace is, an unmerited favor of God. He says the grace and peace of God is given to you in Jesus Christ, right? And then out of this, here's the only question I really want to answer today, but, but you're going to notice in the next few verses that he gives us five different answers as to what God has done to give us his grace and his peace. What does it look like to receive the grace and peace of God? What does it look like for that to be given to us? Well, watch how he does this. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, number one, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, a, a blessing is a term that in our culture has been hijacked a little bit. In fact, uh, maybe more than a little bit, uh, I think that the general understanding of what it means to be blessed in American culture and uh, broader than Christian living is that you would receive uh, a good amount of material. Blessing is almost always connected to uh, prosperity or a peace of health or uh, an understanding of life going according to the flow that you would most desire it to go to. In fact, uh, you can turn a TV on any Sunday morning and find uh, in short order somebody who's going to come and do a job like mine, but instead of telling you the truth from the scripture, is going to tell you that if you uh, just do a certain set of things, you will be 
blessed, and when they use that word, they have no intention of speaking about spiritual life. They have every intention of talking about you receiving the things that you most want in this world and almost always looking to some type of material blessing. Uh, The reality is that Paul, even in his day, sees how valuable it is to know that this is not what blessing really is because, look, he continues on to define it. He's blessed us with what? with every spiritual blessing, and he does it in the heavenly places. That the idea of blessing would be, first and foremost, a spiritual life that is in God, and it is more than just what is here in material, right? So when he says grace and peace comes to you from God, he's speaking of a peace that is not all circumstances always working out for our gain, but rather a peace from God that recognizes that in any earthly circumstance, we have no need to fret because we have a spiritual blessing that is for us in the heavenly places, that we ought to be looking beyond this world, that nothing in this world can dash our hope which exists in Christ. And nothing in this world can fulfill our hope, which exists in Christ. That in good circumstances and bad, we are blessed not because of the things of this world, but blessed because of the spiritual blessing that is in the heavenly places that is in Jesus. That's why, again, you go back to the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus tells, and he begins this with what's known as the Beatitudes or the blessings. And he says, blessed are those. And then he gives a whole list of things that we would... uh, be hesitant to associate with blessings in our earthly culture, right? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are mourning. Blessed are the meek or those who are downtrodden. Blessed are those who are, he even finishes off with this one, who are persecuted for his name's sake. But recognizes that blessing here and now is not indeed the deepest level of blessing, but that blessing is spiritual, That the beauty of what it means to be in Christ, to know God, is that through his grace, he has given you a peace, a spiritual blessing, and he has blessed us in such a way that nothing, nothing in this world can fulfill our hope. Nothing in this world can crush our hope, because where is our hope? It's in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, he continues on. And notes this. Uh, in fact, before we look at these next two, I just I just mentioned this. If you're kind of a a, a book reading. Uh, intellectual level, like to think about it, talk about it type of Christian. These next two uh, group themselves together and they tend to be a place where a lot of Christians find themselves in deep embedded arguments. Uh, and, And it's not that they're not worth discussion. They are. However, watch how Paul is employing them here, what the scripture means to do with these next two things that God has done in our lives, they're not meant to be sources of argument, but sources of encouragement for the believer as to what your life looks like. He goes on and he says this, just as he, God, chose us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to himself according to the kind intention of his will. What does the grace of God look like? What is our position before God according to his grace? Well, God chose us, and the Bible says, before the foundation of the world, and God predestined us as adoption, to adoption as sons. God came and chose you and I, that it was not first our doing to decide something, but rather that God in his love brought you into the fold, adopted you and I as sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. Now, like I said, the the tendency in uh, religious cultures is to kind of argue about what this means, to debate what this has to do with our free will, and uh, certainly we must make some type of conscious choice along with this, and we kind of have a tendency to build out these different things, and, and I'm not saying not to do that. One of the things, though, that I think is important that we recognize is, is a counter-argument to this a lot of times is that God only chose us because he looked ahead and saw that you and I were going to make the right choice of our own. 
and said, well, I'll choose the ones who are going to choose me. And so it's an argument of the foreknowledge of God, ignores that whole phrase in there before the foundation of the world. Uh, But in this, the idea of that, I just want to kind of press against for just a moment because of what we said earlier, which is that if we're going to base who we are on primarily, first and foremost, our abilities or our choices, it tends to go from bad to worse. Amen? You with me? Uh, here's, here's what I mean. Uh, if, if I were to look at my own righteousness as the standard of whether or not God would choose me, the reality is I know my own heart and my own life better than you know it of me, and I have a worse opinion of it than you do of me. Almost, well, maybe not not all of you, but most of you, uh, if you're here this morning, (laughs) the other ones have left. Uh, But in this, right, uh, I know that not only is it broken, but as every passing day goes by, if I'm only to work in my own abilities, in my own righteousness, it gets more and more and more broken. In fact, as we try to clean up the messes of our lives in our own power, what we have a tendency to do is just make them worse. Amen? You with me? Right, like um, we have, we we had uh, a like robot vacuum. How many of you guys have one of those horrifying, terrible things? It's, it's like fifty. 50. Uh, if you if you're like on the fence and you want a product review, my wife is very in favor of them. I am very not in favor of them. So you can you can talk to both of us. You get like the full devil's advocate argument all the way through. Uh, We did not buy one. We had one bought for us. Uh, My parents got me one as like a housewarming gift and was like, ah, try this out. And Whitney was like, this is the greatest thing ever. It cleans up everything, and, and basically what it does, you don't do anything. You just put it on a charger, and at a, at a certain time, every single day, it leaves the charger on its own. Uh, like, I watch Terminator, you know, so I, like, this is just, it's not a great starting point, but it just goes, and it starts to vacuum up over your whole house, just catches everything. Uh, you don't have to do a single thing about it. Now, all was well and good until a couple months ago, we got a puppy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the puppy is not my idea, which means that when the puppy leaves a gift in the house, I'll make people aware, but I wasn't like in a hurry to go pick that up. Should have been. Should have been, right? Because I walked through the living room and I said, hey, the dog pooped in the living room, and whether it was Whitney or one of the kids, I don't even remember, but they said, yeah, I'll clean it up in a minute. I said, okay, no problem. I went went in, and and shortly after that, you hear the doo-doo-doo-doo, and the the vacuum heads out, right? And and it's at work. And I come back out like 10 minutes later, and we no longer have, okay, I don't, I was, I was looking for an image, but I'm going to spare you, right? It's just, now we had a living room and we had a little hardworking robot vacuum just consistently in random patterns according to the Wi-Fi spreading dog poop all through our living room, right? Like, I suggested we clean it and uh, it did not survive, right? So we, we now have a new robot vacuum. <laughs> Some things you just can't come back from. Uh, but what occurred to me was, was this has a tendency to be an image of our own self-oriented works of righteousness, right? Is that uh, we feel like if we're going to clean up our lives according to our own power, that we can work at it and we can work at it and we can work at it. I can promise you this, it would not have mattered how long we let that robot vacuum continue. It was not going to make the house clean at any point, right? Because all it was doing was spreading the mess more and more and more and more and more. Right? You ever notice how sin has a way of doing that in our lives? That we do something wrong and then uh, rather than repent and turn to the Lord, we begin to try to fix our own problem and we begin to work harder at it and we get, begin to think, oh, I could just, if I could just get this right, I could get all of this sorted out in my life. And what you end up finding is what began as a small problem has now spread into a worse and worse and worse problem. 
All you're thinking about is the smell. I, it was bad, okay? But in this, here's, here's the idea behind God who chose us, who predestined us to adoption before the foundation of the world. It was not because you are all cleaned up. It's not because you have your life together. It's not because I am deserving of it. It was while we were in the book of Colossians, it says, aliens hostile to God, engaged in evil deeds. It is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That the idea of what it means to be in Christ is that he came for you. He chose you. He adopted you. He pulled you out before you even knew it. And he did so according to to his grace. Why is this such good news? Well, well, look at what he says he did it for. In verse 4, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, if it's all on us, if, if the Christian life is a life of self-discipline and working harder, and the reality is that you go out and we say, hey, if you want to be a Christian, you need to be holy and blameless before the Lord, and that's done or achieved through your good working we fail again and again and again and again. It's a life of constant failure. But Paul doesn't note that to be holy and blameless is a recognition of who we are. It's a recognition of the God who chose us, who adopted us, who brought us back. Look at how he concludes this in the next couple of verses, right? In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. Here's, here's the reality of who God is, that God is a God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the way that he chose you and I, the way that he predestined you and I to adoption as sons and daughters in him. He did it by redeeming you in Christ Jesus, by buying you back. That's what that word means, that he looked at us in our sinful condition, in our sinful state, and by the grace of God which he lavished on us. That means he applied it liberally. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't decide that you and I weren't worth it, but rather in his grace he pours out a spiritual blessing in Christ to adopt you, to bring you into the fold to redeem you away from your sinful, broken, hostile, alienated state and into salvation in Christ. That you and I would remember our position before the Lord. And so as we uh, move forth and move out, what we'll see over and over and over again in this letter is this, that you and I are meant to be a people who would walk forth the will of God in our life, would walk forth as a people confident that we are holy and blameless before the Lord, that would walk forth proclaiming the good news of Jesus but we don't do it to earn something. We don't do it in our power, and we don't do it by our ability. We do it because of the message of the gospel, that you and I are in Christ, right? Look, look again at this notation of God's work in all of this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us, in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us as, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. That's Christ, the beloved. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. In just a few short verses, six times Paul's reminding us, what does it mean to know God? It means that he has come for us and that we are meant to be a people who find ourselves fully submitted to, fully trusting in, fully worshiping the beauty of his son, Jesus Christ, who has come and in him we have life. In him we have salvation. In him we have redemption. In him we have the forgiveness of sins that we would be a people, saints, who are faithful 
to Christ Jesus. Why don't you pray with me, and we'll sing one more song. Lord, let us remember who we are. I think we're so tempted, we're so focused on living a life far too invested in our own power, in our own ability, thinking that we can do it in our own way. I'm convinced that it is not what we were made for. It is not who we are. I pray that you would remind us that we are in you, that you have blessed us, that you have chose us, that you have predestined us, that you've redeemed us and lavished your grace upon us. And in all this, Lord, I pray that it would cause us to be a people who treasure you and worship you in all things. Help us to walk forward in that. Lord, I pray for those who uh, have never found themselves to be in you, have never placed faith in you, never trusted you, that you choose them today, that they respond by uh, no longer depending on self, no longer depending on their workings or their righteousness, but rather that their life would be surrendered to your grace and walk forth in faith in Christ. Lord, let your spirit work in mighty ways. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.